Love that worship. If you have your Bible, let's turn to Ephesians chapter 1. We're going to continue our study this morning in this morning worship service about the church of Jesus Christ. And this is one of my scriptures in, that I love to study out. This is one of those scriptures that you can spend months and months and months and not exhaust so much in this text. Beginning of verse 18, it says, The eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that ye may know what is the hope of his calling, what is the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, and what is the exceeding greatness of his power towards us who believe, according to the working of his mighty power, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own, own right hand in heavenly places far above all principality and power and might and dominion and that is named not only in this age, but also in that which is to come and has put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that fills all in all. Chapter two, verse one says, and, and you has he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins. And we're going to be talking about the church of Jesus Christ today in depth. We're going to be talking about the call, the hope of his calling in, uh, in verse uh, 19. Father, we thank you for the time together this morning. We thank you for the privilege to be in your midst with the body of Christ. Father, we thank you for these brothers and sisters that have gathered together to give you praise and glory for who you are and what you're doing in our lives. Father, we've come here this morning to give you praise and thanksgiving. Continue to use us in your service as we reach out to this community and try to share Christ with all those that we come in contact with. Father, I pray that our lives will be a lighthouse here, here on this corner as we have been called here in Loxahatchee area to try to show forth the love of Christ and present the gospel of Christ and the word of God in a, in a godly manner and a pleasing manner so people can be saved and lives changed because of the preaching and teaching of the Word of God. The Bible says faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. And Lord, I thank you that we can be uh, consistent here and we can be honest with the truth of the Word of God and preach it and teach it with power and might through the Holy Spirit. And I pray that your Holy Spirit will take the message of the day and, and impregnate it on our hearts. I pray he'll edify us and build us up so we can be better servants as we're here called together to be fitly framed and and reach out in this community and share Christ. And Father, we just pray that we'll be worthy of that vocation to which you've called us here. In Jesus' name, amen. Cheryl. Welcome, Cornerstone. Remember the question I've been asking, why are you here today? Well, we're trying to put some meat on the bones and ask ourselves every week why we're here. Uh, that's a glaring question, to be honest with you. You could be in a jillion different churches in Palm Beach County today, and and uh, some of them are big and fancy and flashy, and uh, pastors are probably better looking and uh, whatever. But you know, <laughs> I guess I uh, asked for that, right? Thank you, Janine. <laughs> Sad thing is true, but I recognize that. If you came from a, for a handsome pastor today, you came to the wrong church. She's trying to get out of it now. See, she's trying to trying to dig her way out of that hole she's in. You know. <laughs> yeah, I, I told my wife a, lo a long time ago. I've never won any beauty contests, so stop trying to dress me up, make me look pretty. You know, it's just not not going to happen. So whatever. But anyhow. We're talking about the Church of Jesus Christ, and give me next slide. We've been spending the last few weeks learned as God, as Jesus Christ says in Matthew 16, upon this rock, referring to Himself being the chief cornerstone. Upon this rock, I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And you know, as we watch our culture kind of slip into a, a bit the abyss here and. In America, and I, I fully believe that uh, 
even in my lifetime, that we may see the church in, in serious persecution here in our country, that we have to hang on to that. We win. Right? If you read the last chapter, the last two chapters of the book, right? We win, right? We're the ones that get to go to glory and spend eternity in heaven. Amen? So, bottom line, and I'm a bottom line kind of guy, the gates of hell cannot prevail against what we're doing here. Okay? And that, that we got to hang on to no matter what happens. That's, what, that's the promise we have that Christ says, I will build my church. It's his church. And the gates of hell shall not prevail. Amen? Give me the next slide. Now, we've been talking about this church in specifics. Last, or the first week, we talked about that it's his church. And we were in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 15 through 19, where not only is it his church, but this entire creation is his. Christ created everything. No, it did not evolve from primordial slime. It didn't come from a Big Bang 18 and a half billion years ago. That's all a bunch of garbage. Okay, Jesus Christ created it. Read Genesis 1, 2, and 3. And if you have any problem with the science, I'll be happy to straighten you out. Been there, done that. But the bottom line is God created mankind for a reason. He created us in his likeness and his image. And then he called out Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob to be his chosen people. And then when they fell into sin repeatedly, he finally turned his attention to the Gentiles, which is most of us today. In the last 2,000 years, the church has been predominantly Gentiles. But ultimately, God is calling out a people, both of the, of the Hebrews and the Gentiles, to spend eternity with Him in glory. And that's the gospel in a big nutshell. That's the Bible in a big nutshell. Okay? If you are a born-again believer today, if you have come to a place in your life where you've realized you were a sinner, you were doomed and, and condemned to hell, and you realize that you're headed to hell and you're living accordingly, and you surrendered your life to Christ because as we just did the Lord's Supper, He went on that cross and He was broken for us. He shed His blood for us. He paid the price for my sins and your sins. And if you believe in that and trust in that, the Bible says you're born again. And your life changes. The Bible says if you're born again, old things pass away. All things become new. Christ introduced that before He ever created mankind. Remember, He's God, right? He already knows the future. He knew when He and the Father decided to, to create this earth and this universe and create mankind, He knew we were going to fall into sin. And He knew the battle that was going on between He and Satan, and Satan was going to get the field day, and Satan's going to take most people to hell with Him. And it's only a remnant that's going to go to heaven. In spite of the social idea today that we're all basically good people and God's a loving God and we're all going to get there. We're just getting there different ways. That's a lie as well. Christ is the one that says, I'm the way, I'm the truth, and I'm the life, and no man what? Comes to the Father what? Okay? So either Christ is a liar or Christ is the only way to glory. That's what the Bible teaches. So society's got to deal with that. But the bottom line, Christ created the church. He created the whole concept of the fact that He was going to call out a people of His own. And He was going to work with among us and in us and through us and show the rest of the world what God is all about through us, the church of Jesus Christ. And He created us. Not only did He create us, but in the next week we saw that through Him the church exists. When you think of the persecution that's gone on since the church was founded, and how many emperors and kings have tried to destroy the church and, and exterminate the Bible off the planet, and we're still here today, 2,000 plus years later, worshiping Christ, and we got more Bibles than the planet's ever seen now, today, particularly in Western culture. How, how many, how many uh, versions do you have on your laptop or your 700 different uh, translations and languages, okay, on, on, a, on an iPad. I mean, that's a good thing, but in reality, it also condemns us because we're without excuse. There's no excuse that we don't know the Word of God in Western culture today, okay, because we got plenty of Bibles, and plenty of, plenty of study helps to study the Bible. 
but Christ created it. And, it, and the Bible says, not only did he create all of the universe, but he created the church, and by him all things consist. Now that word in the Greek means literally he's holding it all together. He makes it all work. So why can we come together week after week and watch him grow this church and reach out and see people saved and, and baptized and watch their lives change? It's because he's making it happen. It's not because of me. It's not because of you. It's not because of us jointly. It's because the Holy Spirit is working through our lives as we reach out to this community to change lives. I can't tell you how many sermons I preach. And I walk in the pulpit and think, boy, that was a dud. Three people get saved. <laughs> you know, somebody comes up, man, that was the best sermon I ever heard. Really? But that's the way the whole world have fun with word studies here. Word and lightning is illumined. You know, you were in darkness. And the light's turned on. That's basically the analogy there. Okay? You know, I love that scripture that I quoted earlier about old things pass away, all things become new. You know, when I look back at 44 years ago when I was saved and how ignoramus, what an ignoramus I was, particularly the spiritual thing, how much he's changed my life. If you'd have told me then I was going to be a preacher, I'd have laughed you to scorn. I wanted nothing to do with scripture. It didn't fit in my hellish life I was leading. And I was enjoying my sinful life. Okay? Getting saved and becoming a Christian and going to church just really wasn't supposed to be part of it. <laughs> okay? But God had other ideas. We're going to talk about that in a minute. But my eyes were enlightened. The scales fell off of my eyes and I was brought out of darkness into the light through Jesus Christ. And it says, it says that you may know. You need to understand, you need to underline that statement in your Bible. That you may know. That's critical. Do you know you're saved today? You know, most of you have heard my testimony, but that's the word that the Lord used to get me saved from uh, John chapter 5, verse 13, that I could know I could have eternal life. And the only way I could know that's because it didn't depend on me. Depended on him on the cross and saving my soul and shedding his blood and, and God the Father accepted his payment for my payment. That's why if I trust him, I get the free ticket to go to heaven. And I can know I have eternal life. And here we're to know, because our eyes are enlightened, we're to know about God. Now what do we didn't know? We're going to look at a few things here and then we're going to focus on one. First thing, the hope of his calling. And that's where we're going to focus today. What is the hope of the call in your life and mine? What is the hope of the call of this church as we come together this morning to worship Him and give Him glory? Why has God called this church to be here? And what is the hope? Now, first of all, the word hope literally means confidence. It's, it's, it's synonymous, 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 I'll get the word out. It's synonymous to faith, hope and faith. What is the riches of his glory in the saints, the inheritance in the saints? What is exceeding greatness of his power towards us who believe according to the working of his mighty power which he wrought in Christ? And we're going to be looking at these in the coming weeks. But what I want to focus on today is this idea of the call, the hope of his calling. Give me the next slide. You know, you ask yourself, why are we here? Why am I here? Why is Carol here? Why is Bruce here? We could go around the room. Why are we here? Some have been here for years. Some have been here a week or two. Everything in between. Some are here every time the doors are open. Some are less faithful. Why? What's that all about? See, the issue is that we are called, if you're here today, you were at least called here today. I said the last couple of weeks, there's no such thing as happenstance in Christianity. God has an ultimate plan. And you're here today because of his plan in your life. You may not realize it. 
Yes, I was drugged to church one time too when I didn't plan on going. Got saved in the meantime. But so I've been there. You know, the only reason I went to church because I had a good looking honey to go with that was taking me there. So no matter how you get here today, it might be a good looking honey brought you here. You're not here by mistake or happenstance. God's got you here for a reason. You might get saved if you're not already saved. That's what happened to me 44 years ago. Because God doesn't do anything by happenstance. Okay. If I ask you today, do you know the hope of the calling on your life? Do you know? Turn to Isaiah 65. You know, I love the Old Testament and how it sets the groundwork for where we are today, thousands of years later. The Lord had his issues with Israel. He sent Isaiah to preach to them that if they did not repent and turn from their wicked ways, he was going to send them into the Babylonian captivity. And in that message that Isaiah preached for 40 years to them, he alluded to the fact that he was going to turn his attention away from Israel, the Hebrews, and he was going to turn his attention to the Gentiles. Isaiah 65 verse 1 says, I am sought by those who ask not for me. Guess who that is? That's the Gentiles. I was sought by those who asked not for me. I am found by those who sought me not. What did Paul write in Romans? He says, there's none righteous, no, not one. There's none that seeks after God. You know, God didn't turn his attentions to the Gentiles because the Gentiles were just so hungry for God. That's not how it works. I wasn't hungry for God when God reached me. I was one of those came kicking and screaming. Anybody else besides me? Maybe a few of you. You know, it just wasn't in my cards. Didn't fit my lifestyle. Didn't fit where I what I thought the world was all about. God had other ideas. Because he's in charge, not me. Look at what he says here. I am sought by those who ask not for me. I am found by those who sought me not. I said, here's the key, behold me. Behold me. You ought to underline those two statements. You know how you get saved? Behold God. Proverbs says the beginning of wisdom is what? Fear of the Lord. You know how little fear of the Lord we have in our culture anymore today? Okay. Who really fears the Lord? Except born again believers. And even then, sometimes you wonder. But that's the beginning of wisdom is fearing the Lord. God says, Behold me. I love the scripture in, in, in John chapter 1 where it says, Jesus, John says, We beheld his glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Imagine having walked with Jesus Christ as a disciple for three and a half years. Listening to all of his sermons, watching all the miracles, watching him resurrect Lazarus from the dead, and watching him go through the beating and the, and, and the, and the crucifixion and then resurrect himself from the dead, <laughs> seeing him alive and ascend up into glory after that. Turn to 1 John chapter 1 with me a minute. Verse 1, John writes, That which was from the beginning, Christ, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and our hands have handled the word of life. 
For the life was manifested, and we have seen it, and bear witness and show unto you the eternal life of the Father, and was manifested unto us. And he's referring to Jesus Christ, having seen him, having heard him, literally having handled him. And he's the life of the life of the world. Eternal life. And that's the Christ we worship today. That's the Christ that created this church. That's the Christ that created the church at large. That's the Christ that's sustaining the church at large. And that's the Christ that's sustaining this church. Is the one that the apostles listened to, saw, and literally handled. And John says, we beheld his glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. You know what that makes me think? When we come together today, we need to beheld his glory. I said last week, know if God exists or not, just look around. God. Amen? Give me the next slide. <clears throat> this term hope of his calling. You know, John says in 1 John that his life was manifest. Again, I go back to, to you and I sitting in these pews today. His life is manifested in each one of us today in some level. Do you understand that? Every believer alive is a walking example to some level of Christ in their life. Some are more godly, some are more holy than others, but bottom line, if you're saved and your life is changing, your friends are wondering what in the world happened to you. Amen? I found religion. That was the thing they kept talking about me. They thought I did it because I wanted to marry Patty. They were just waiting for me to implode after I married her would end up divorced. That's what, you know, is, is my, my mom and dad are flying back on the airplane. I proposed to her over in, in the Bahamas, and she's flying back with my mom and dad on the airplane. My mom's trying to talk her out of marrying me the whole way back. Thank you, Mom. <laughs> but Mom knew me. I'd only been saved two months. And she was a godly young woman, and I was anything but, including a woman. I don't know that I had, had that. <laughs> uh, moving right along. Give me a next slide. <clears throat> this is a major problem we have in churches today, particularly in Western culture, and particularly I can only associate really here in America. You know, philosophically, America's in deep trouble. We're involved in our existential culture. We bought into the French Renaissance that took place back in the 17, 1800s in Europe. We bought into most of those philosophies, what they call the Enlightenment period of, of humanism. And we bought into it as Americans today, pretty much. And I, and I say, unfortunately, a lot of us in the church, have, to a large point, have adopted those philosophies as well. And one of the things that's happened in that philosophy through the Enlightenment period is the idea that the emotions control. Truth is found in the emotions, okay? The idea that the heart is considered the seat of emotions and feelings. And that permeates modern psychology today. That's why the U.S. Supreme Court can just pass a law that... that uh, you know, it's okay for homosexuals to marry because and be immoral because they're in love. Because of the emotions of love. And as I said a couple weeks ago, love never justifies immorality. Whether it's heterosexual, homosexual, or no sexual. Love never justifies immorality, biblically. So we've lost the fact that the idea, we've got this idea that, you know, it's how I feel. 
is what should drive. What should, I should make my decisions based on what makes me feel good, what makes me feel wonderful, what makes me feel safe, what makes me feel comfortable. And that should drive my decision making. Now that's not how the ancients thought. Going back to the Greeks and, 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 and uh, the, the Hebrews or whatever, Chaldeans, it was the exact opposite. The heart was the center of thought. And the center of wisdom and understanding was the heart. And the emotions were considered a good Old Testament word, the bowels. In other words, when you're hungry, that's a feeling you need to feed. <laughs> that's a sincere feeling because you're hungry. Okay? But it was considered the bowels, the, 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 the physical part of the body was considered the feelings. That's where you're feeling. When you burnt your finger, that's telling you, <laughs> you know, don't do that again. Yeah, exactly. But we flip-flop that in, in Western culture today. And people are always coming to church based on what the church is going to do for them. How they're going to feel about coming to church. And that's not biblical. It's a call. How does, what does that mean? Acts chapter 1 verse 18 talks about Judas Iscariot going out and buying a potter's field with his uh, 30 pieces of silver because it made him feel good about having to betray his Messiah. And he died on that potter's field. So it's worthless to him. Because he was, he was so distraught about having betrayed Jesus and saw him beat him up and, and crucify him that he tried to, to solve that feeling by buying a field with these 30 pieces of silver and it doesn't do the job. That's the worthlessness of feelings at times. Feelings deceive. Emotions deceive. Give me next slide. Reasons not to go to a church. My friends go there. The worship makes me feel so good. The music program's awesome. They have a wonderful youth group. My kids just have a blast there. I really like the pastor and his wife, or maybe, maybe not him, but her. My friends really like it. None of those are reasons to go to a church. Do you know that? Not one of those are reasons to pick a church. It's true. As I was thinking about this whole thing, my, I, I did a little homework on my my own life, my wife and I's life together is one in Christ, trying to serve Christ together as one, as the Bible says, we're to leave father and mother and cleave unto one another, and become one, and that's body, soul, and spirit. And I thank God that my wife and I have served together all these years. She's an integral part of my ministry. Probably, I, you know, she's the, the key to my ministry, in my opinion, over the years. She's the one that keeps me organized and keeps me on straight and narrow. Most of you know I'm my attention span is about that long. But we've been involved in six different churches in 44 years. Now, the first one I was saved in, she was already going there. So I kind of got roped into that one. Not one of those churches, like I say, I got roped into the first one, so let's just eliminate that one for me, but the next five, not one of them did we go there as a couple praying about God leading us where he wanted us. Not one of them did we go there because we liked the church. And we thought that would be a great place to go and enjoy ourselves. Not one. When we left the first church, we left because I learned as I got involved in leadership that the pastor was involved in filthy lucre and he was misappropriating funds. And on top of that, he was bigoted and mentioned it from the pulpit a few times. 
And I just, my wife and I felt that's, our, our ministry was over there. We just couldn't serve under that anymore. So we left. We just prayed about leaving. The second church we went to was an elderly white hair that was running about 75 or 80 people because they'd just been through a split. They'd been about 150 to 200, and they'd been through a big split. We stayed because the church had no young couples and no kids and no youth group. And there were two other young couples who had just joined with had a couple kids. And we thought if we joined along with them, we might help grow this church and, and bring in some young couples and, and, and start a youth group and whatever and, and grow the church. And that's why we stayed. We ended up there seven, almost 17 years. I used to run the youth group. At one point, we were running 50 kids. We're life clubs. Wanna. Kids running everywhere. I was teaching a young adult Sunday school class with 60 in it. It had nothing to do with me. Just God wanted that church to grow with young couples, and he called my wife and I, along with two other couples, to start that ministry at that time in that church when it was dying because it was all old folks and they had no clue how to reach out to young people. And they were down in a dead area of Lake Worth. See? But that was a call that my wife and I felt we had on our life to go with Dick and Marsha Harrington and Irvin Dora Meldrum and start trying to grow a young group in that church. When we, our ministry was over there, 17 years later, we'd moved out of west of town. It was too far to drive, other issues going on. My wife and I had three teenage daughters. We were like you. You know what we Arlene knows. <laughs> we ended up a little bit, 20 people, meeting in an elementary school down here. At, uh, Okeechobee and Samara. Our three daughters were the only three. Anybody under 40, we were 35. I guess Arlene was probably, what are you, 30, 35 at the time, maybe? Uh, But you're that now, right? I forgot. I'm sorry. Shoot, man, I'm in trouble now. Uh, but the church had no young people. It had no youth group. It had no worship leader. It had a young pastor that I liked and thought my background, I could maybe mentor him a little bit, which worked for a little while. We spent two and a half years there. In the meantime, God used that church to get me ordained. That wasn't in the cars when we went there. I had no idea that God called me there to get me ordained. I wasn't even seeking ordination. But it was a call to that church that I didn't want to go to. The night my wife and I realized we were going there, we're riding down some little Pratt, she's crying all the whole way home. I said, what's the matter? She says, you know what's the matter. I said, yeah, you know God's calling us to this church and you don't want to go there. And she says, I know. You're right. What is a call? Now, most of you know the story. After that, I, I, I got ordained. I knew I was called to North Carolina. And I already had the church picked out, right? That one on the hill that you've heard me talk about. The last place I wanted to be a pastor was West Palm Beach. I've been here all my life, and most everybody that knew me before Christ wasn't going to listen to me anyhow. So I don't bother going to my high school reunions. They all knew me before. <laughs> well, a lot of them know me now. But, uh, but I just felt that church calling me in North Carolina. And after a two-week vacation, came back and we had a church in our living room two weeks later. That wasn't part of a class. That wasn't part of the deal either. We passed that for 10 years. Then as we were looking for some place to do with that church, we fellowship. 
I fought God over it. Carol won. But that's the. I didn't want any of them. None of them were, of them were any of those questions. Huh? But God, it's a ministry. And God's got a call on you. It isn't just because I'm a pastor. I wasn't a pastor when he called me the first hold the calling on your life and he brought you for call you to the jungles of Africa. Give me next slide. We got to move on here. <clears throat> the call of God is based on faith. Are you surrendered to Him? He says, "Behold me. Pick up your cross. Follow me. I'll provide. I'll lead. I'll guide. I'll give you the power." I'll tell you what to say, when to say it. Are you willing to surrender to me? That's ministry. The Apostle Paul says, I'm a bond servant to Christ. Sold out. Bond servant. He owns me. Christ owns me, Paul says. Is that how you see yourself as here this morning in, in, in this church? says we're not we don't belong to ourselves we're bought with a price the blood of Christ bought me he owns me he owns you if you're saved today you're not your own we have no right to want to live our life our way because he bought me he bought you Faith is based on the understanding. The Bible says faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. The more you hear the Word of God, the more you study the Word of God, the more your faith grows, the more you realize you're not owned by yourself. you got no choice but to serve Him with your life. And that's where your joy in life is, is serving Him. Hopefully you get to the point you don't want anything to do with that junk out there. It's all worthless. It's that confidence. Give me the next slide. We've got to move on. <clears throat> We're going to run through a bunch of stuff quick here. Stay with me. If you want to write some of these scriptures down, you can look at them later. I'd hope to spend a little more time here, but with the Lord's Supper and all, we're out of time. God's call on our life in Romans 8 29 says that we're, to not, that we're to be, not to be conformed to the image of His Son. We're to be conformed to the image of His Son. That's the purpose of your life as a believer in this life is to be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. That's why God's working on you, to make you like Christ, so other people can see Christ in you. That's why we gather together as the body of Christ, so people can see the love of Christ shed abroad in the hearts of you and I, which crosses every group that you can imagine. This is the only place in the world that you'll see a group like this gathered together and all of us be in love with each other. Okay? It's only going to happen in Christ. It's also a call in our lives to be called to be saints, and that's a big term. We can spend a lot of time there. What's that mean? Be a saint, be godly, holy, that's what, in, a, in a nutshell. God's call in our life in 1 Corinthians 1, 9 is we're called to in the fellowship of His Son, Jesus Christ, and our Lord. I love to watch you guys worship, as I mentioned last week. Nothing more exciting. That's the fellowship that we have together. I can enjoy you, and you can enjoy me, and we can enjoy Christ together. Singing praises and, 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 and glorifying God together. And as Carol and I shared Wednesday night, it's fun to be up here and watch you guys worship on Sunday mornings. It is awesome. This is a worshiping church, and I love it. It's not fancy. We don't have an orchestra. We don't have the, the band and all that stuff. But I know you guys worship. You know what that tells me? We don't need all that fancy stuff. 
We don't need all that stuff to worship. We really don't. God's calling our life in 1 Corinthians 7, 22 says we're called therein, the body of Christ, to abide in Christ. Now that's a key word. Word abide means move in and be comfortable. Is Christ comfortable with you today? And where you are in your life? Are you comfortable with Him? The Bible talks about the peace of God and the peace with God. Okay, Do you have that this morning? Are you here comfortable that you're here? You know, some people walk through these doors and you can watch them squirm in the pews. They can't wait till I get done so they can get out of here. I see it from up here, trust me. Okay, We're to be comfortable because we're here this morning. This is the family of God, as we mentioned earlier. These are brothers and sisters in Christ, and we gather together to, in unity, worship Christ together. We're called here to do this this morning. It's a call on your life. It's a call on mine. Galatians 5.13 uh, 5, says that we're called into liberty. Now, I like this one. This is freedom in Christ. Now, that, that doesn't mean freedom to go live like hell. We have freedom to live within the confines that God has given us as His Son, as the example. And then we have freedom to be ourselves. And I learned a long time ago, it's best not to be phony. Just be yourself in Christ and serve Him. And He'll honor that. Give me the next slide. Oh, I wish I could get further in this. We are called to the vocation, Romans chapter, uh, Ephesians 4 1. We spent quite a bit of time on that teaching it in Sunday school. We, we personally, the word vocation literally means call. And what this means is that you're called to the calling. None of our calls are the same, but we all have a calling. Now, what it means is, God has a purpose for your life, and He's saying, come on, do it. You know, it's, 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 not, it's not an option, really, but, but He gives us free will, right? You can either serve, you, serve Him with your life the way He wants you to, or you can say, no, God, I want to go do it my way. And we all have that choice. He has a call or a purpose for your life, and He's saying, come on, serve me. Do it my way. Try me. See? And are we willing? That's the key. Are we willing to surrender our lives and serve Him? Give me the next slide. Nope, back up. We've got to talk about this last one. First Peter chapter 5, verse 10 says, We are called unto God's eternal glory through the sufferings of Christ. Now, this is where the church goes off the rail in America today. You don't hear pastors preach about suffering for Christ. That doesn't fill pews. Doesn't fill pews. That scripture that everybody quotes in Romans uh, 8 says, uh, you know, all things work together to good for them that, that uh, love Christ, right? We like to quote that part, right? But if you keep reading... A couple of verses down, it says that he spared not his son the cross. We're going, to be, we're going to be conformed to the image of his son because we suffer for him. See? We're to be partakers. We're baptized in the sufferings of Christ, the Bible says. What does that mean? We don't have a concept of that in, in Western culture today because the church really hasn't suffered in our lifetime. We think not having enough money to pay our bills this week, we're really suffering, maybe. Try what's going on over in the Middle East right now. Where Christians are being burned out and wives raped and murdered and put in prison and all kinds of things in the name of Jesus. And we're oblivious to that here in this country. We read about it, but in reality, we have no concept. But you know what? That might be the call on your life. It might be. 
I think about the five guys that were called down to the Ecuadorian jungle and then were killed back in 1956. Why? So God could reach the Aka Indians. <laughs> Call those five guys down there just to martyr them. And you know over the next five years, or over 35,000 young people gave their lives to Christ to go full-time to the mission field because of the life of those five men. And the wise went in and reached the Aka Indians, and today over 85% of all the Aka Indians along that Kure River are saved. Bill, you personally met grandfather, right? I mean, what a story. That God called those five men to be martyred. In his will, they were martyred, serving him. Their call on his, on their, his call on their life was to be martyred. Young men. See? We don't think that way. But that's, that's the call on this church, is to come here at all cost and serve one another and serve Christ together. Amen? I'm going to close with that. Father, we thank you. You know I didn't get halfway through my sermon. These sermons are big, rich. Father, I just love this church. I love what you're doing here. I love the people that you're fitly framing together here. God, I know you have great things in this church and for this community as we continue to reach out to it. I pray you continue to grow us in numbers. I pray we'll continue to see people saved and lives changed. I pray we, we as a church, we faithful to the vocation that you've called us to. I pray that we'll be faithful in attendance. I pray we'll be faithful in, in support. I pray that we'll be faithful in our, our involvement to this church because you have a work here for us to do. You've called us out as your church or cornerstone to do a work here in this area. Father, I pray you'll, you'll, you'll motivate us to, to be involved and that you'll get all the glory and all the honor and what you're doing in our midst. Thank you. We can be here today. Father, thank you for the word of God that inspires us to follow you and serve you. I wish we could spend hours in going through each of these scriptures one by one. Father, bless us now throughout the day in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen.